In tonight's video, we're revisiting a classic. We're going to pull apart again the Netgear GS105E switch and do a proper teardown review, but this time with decent photography. Gentlemen and ladies, welcome back to the shop. Firstly, if you have liked and subscribed the previous videos, thank you so much. It really does help us out and we can see that we are actually starting to grow as a channel now and the more we grow, the more stuff we can do. We're not all from an IT background, so let's just break this down a little bit. What does a switch actually do? Well, a switch is a device that allows multiple cable devices to talk to each other. Now, where they come into their own and where we particularly use them in industry is if you have a long cable run to a remote location. So let's take this example. Your internet router is downstairs and you have a Cat5 cable running all the way around your house to the upstairs office. And all of a sudden in the upstairs office, you want to plug in additional devices. So what you can do is you can take your little five port switch, plug in your existing cable into the switch and then plug in your other devices to the other ports on that switch and that will allow all of those devices to communicate back to the internet through the single cable run that you have. Okay, so that is what we get. On the healing bench today, we have a Netgear GS105E ProSafe switch. One of the metal cased versions. So let's dive straight in. This is the managed version of the switch. Let's pull these screws out and see what nastiness lies within. Okay, let's move that out of the way. Let's have a look at this top cover first. And not too bad, the edges are nice and smooth. Some uh, apprentice marks inside. Looks like a date code or something there, perhaps a serial number. The only nastiness is on these punched, just this one punched hole at the back for the Kensington lock. It's actually quite badly punched, there's some sharp edges there, but the rest of the case you could quite happily run your fingers around. It's not going to cut you or skewer you. The coating's quite nice on here. Doesn't, it seems to be fairly tough, so it would stand up well in a little office. So we've got standard printed circuit board. Looks quite nicely laid out. Let's pop these screws out. <coughs> Have a look at the back side of the board. One thing to make it look pretty from the top, but often the back side of the board is a different kettle of fish altogether. I think it's just the two screws on this, then the board should just lift out. Oh, look at that. Let's move that out of the way for a sec. So we've got some plastic here that's actually covering up where you put the hangy screws for your, um, if you want to hang this on the wall, it can mount, you know, various different ways, but to stop the screw actually pushing on the board, They've installed these little plastic covers, like some sort of PVC, I guess. And again, the metalwork quality is fairly decent. We've got some, these screw holes here, these threaded screw holes are punched. So there's a bit of sharpness on the back of those. But the rest of it, the rest of the apertures are quite nice and, you know, they're not going to cut you. So that's a fairly good job there, Netgear. Let's have a look at the board. So fairly standard printed circuit board. I do know from looking up the manufacturer's codes that these are actually only cleared uh, 10 100. They're not gigabit capable. Well, they're, they're not specified at a gigabit. They're probably more than capable. They're just little uh, decoupling transformers to take off any nastiness that happens to hit the ports. But yeah, not a bad job. Capacitors have a nice little, um, if you can see that on there, I'll put a picture up. There's, the capacitors have a nice uh, plastic coating or rubberized coating on them. Back of the board looks nicely laid out. There is some 
there is a little bit of nastiness just here and someone's obviously come in this socket's probably soldered in after the fact uh, so they pick and place all these other little components and they'll come in and somebody actually manually solders this on and you can see they've they just held that iron on there a bit too long or a bit too close to the board and they've scorched the board but yeah not too bad I'd like to see that crustiness off because that will eventually rot through the board if it's uh, containing a bit of acid in there uh, and that crustiness is actually, I don't know if you can pick that up, but that crustiness is all over the board as well. It's not just in one spot, it's actually completely covering the board. On the front, you've got your network sockets here, uh, five of them. A uh, bank of four and one, which is actually a different manufacturer because there's a, there's a stamp on top of that one, but not on these ones. And again, little bits of crustiness on there, but generally speaking, not too bad. You can see where they're cost saving. This LED holder here has space for two LEDs. So on one of the other versions, there's probably an extra LED and they're using the same board, perhaps populating it slightly differently. Got your fairly standard barrel connector on the back, 12 volt input into there. We'll see what that can, can suffer. And uh, a reset switch on the back, because this is actually the smart version of the switch. So under here, there'll be a little Atmel processor. Uh, it could be an Atmel, could be something else. Um, but it just contains a little web browser that you can program some of the features of this switch and that's just a reset button for when it gets its knickers in a twist and fails on you so you can reset it back to factory defaults. Normally when someone's forgot the password, nice little clicky switch, nice little click action on there. But yeah, on the whole, not too bad. We've got to remember that these are produced to a price point and that price point is 26 quid um, as of the time of this video. And uh, as such, they've got to be built down to that price. So there's got to be some corners cut somewhere. Uh, to be honest, I couldn't, you know, even if I bought the components, I couldn't even make that for myself for that price. So we've got our lab power supply connected to our unit under test, which is the net gear. I've set this to 12 volts and I've limited that to one amp current. So let's fire that up and see if she blows. So up to 83 milliamps there, and then back down to 23. Some stuff going on there. Okay, so it's now sat at 25 milliamps. Now that's going to fluctuate depending on what's going on with the switch. But what I did want to just show you is that if we just turn that off a sec, let's reduce this current, let's reduce this voltage. Let's go down to four and a half volts. Okay, let's see if that powers up. Oh, it does. Current's a bit higher. So that'll drop off and then it'll go back up. So you could run this off of a battery without any problems. Let's just see how low we can go. So let's turn that off. And we'll go down. Let's go down in point 10. At point 0.1 of a, a volt. Okay, so at 4.4 volts it won't power on, 4.5 volts it will. Okay, let's go the other way. So let's go up to good marker would be 13.8, which is the charge voltage of a car. So could you run this off a car cigarette lighter socket? Yeah. Seems quite happy. Down and then back up again. No, it's going to sit there, right? 23 milliamps. Right, so let's go up a bit more. Fifteen volts. Yeah, seems quite happy. Okay. So as we saw from that, we can actually run this Netgear switch. In a pinch, we can run it obviously off the mains because it comes with a mains adapter. However, if you're stuck in the field in the middle of nowhere, you could run this off a PP3 battery for an hour or so and it wouldn't cause you any trouble. It can also be run if you're putting together some sort of multimedia center in your car or you need a little switch, this thing will quite happily run on the charge voltage of a car battery. Okay, so we've got our computer hooked up. We're on the right IP range. We've gone to the, the URL 192.168.0.239. You can see the interface to our switch. So we'll just pop in the password. 
which is, of course, a password. You can see I've already logged in and put my name in the, you can actually name the, ind the individual switches. So I've called this one Roop's Switch. Um, you can set it to obtain its IP address from DHCP. Although interestingly enough, it hasn't. We'll disable that for a sec. So we can here look at the port status. So we can see that port one is up and the rest are all down. This is great if you're remotely based. You can see exactly what's going on. Loop detection, um, that's enabled by default. So we'll leave that on. Uh, power saving mode is enabled by default. I'm not sure why we can't see the option there. And switch management mode. I've set this to, uh, let's just move that across. Web browser and plus utility, that's the default setting. In the maintenance, we can reboot the device, we can factory default it, we can take a firm, we can make a firmware upgrade, and we can save the configuration or restore the configuration. That's really useful, guys. If this, if you have a complicated setup, so you've got some VLANs, you've got some phone stuff, you've got some VoIP prioritization, you've got a user that's whoring the internet and you want to rein them in a little bit, that's all configured on your switch. If you ever have to replace that switch, um, it's much easier just to have a configuration file that's up to date that you can just pull off. So what I generally do is um, is I just take the configuration file. Every time I happen to deal with that switch and I make a change, I just download another configuration file. So if I do ever have to change it, it's really not a big issue. We put the new switch in, we blow the configuration into it, and everyone picks up and goes on just as they were before. Yeah, nice feature. Uh, monitoring, we can, uh, so we've got some port statistics. You can see here there's some information because we're obviously connected to port one. Um, in the port mirroring, this is an interesting feature. So if you have a laptop and you have Wireshark enabled on it and you want to see what's going on or through a specific port on the switch or two ports on the switch, you can just tick them and then all that information will be mirrored onto all of those ports. So if you plug your Wireshark in, uh, your Wireshark laptop into here, you will see all of the information that's going through these two ports. That can be a very, very powerful tool if you want to find information um, or if you want to track down a specific network related problem. Cable tester, you can loop back. At, so this is telling me that I did run a quick test on cable one. It's plugged into another Netgear switch. The test result was OK. There's obviously no cable fault distance because there's no cable fault. We're running a, a very short half a meter or probably a meter cat six cable to the next to the next switch up yeah some igmp multicast stuff that's probably a little bit beyond the scope of this but something i've not seen in the switch of this pro at this price point ever uh, vlans so you can set basic port port based vlan so you can put port one into one vlan port two into another vlan or you can have a slightly more advanced configuration QoS, so you can you can make port one uh, a high priority if that's your uplink port. Um, there's lots of things you can do with this. It's, it's, this is this is just literally my mind is blown uh, with what Netgear have crammed into this switch. There's nothing else on the market that could compete with this at this price point, as far as I'm aware. Excuse my phone in the background. So rate limiting, if you've got someone whoring the internet and you need to rein them in a little bit, you can actually set a limit all the way up to half a, uh, 512 megabits. So uh, really, really helpful tool. Sometimes administrators of networks will use that as a warning shot. So they'll rein in someone's, they'll, they'll, they'll set them to half a meg up and down. And that way, that does two things. It lets them know that they're being monitored. Um, because they'll see their internet speed drop off and any files that they're sharing. But also what you'll find is that if it's if you can narrow it down to one specific user and you know it's on that port, then you can alleviate the problem for the rest of the network just by putting those limits in place. So the Netgear GS105E, is it a good deal? Well, yeah, on balance, I think it probably is. We have to remember that Netgear are building this down to a price point and that price point is £26 and that's got to include the packaging, the power supply, all the documentation, the shipping and any warranty claims. Now inside this unit, yet yeah, there's a little bit of crustiness on the board which a little bit more cleanliness in the factory could have resolved. However, the end unit is quite functional, 
it's well made, it's robust, and I think it will last you a good number of years. So yeah, I think it's a pretty good deal. Anyway guys, that's all I have for you tonight. If you have liked this review, please do like, share and subscribe because it, like I say, it really does help us out. And the more we spread the word about the channel, the more stuff we can do. Anyway guys, take care. See you next time.